yells. Welcome to Home Studio Q&A here on Studio Live today. My name is Pete and this is our weekly show where I attempt to answer all of your questions about home recording, mobile recording, the gear, the mindset, the lifestyle, the clubhouse, question mark. And uh, we do this every week. So uh, welcome to those who are here on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, if you aren't joining us live, we do this every week, and it's a Sunday morning for me, Saturday afternoon, 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, and 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time every single Saturday. So if you want to join us live, you can do that. If you're watching on the replay, don't worry, we love you just as much. And if you do have any questions, you can actually put them in through the week. You don't have to wait for the form. You can act, don't have to wait for the show. You can drop them in the form. And that's at studiolivetoday.com slash QA. And uh, you can find that uh, just like uh, Patrick has done here. And Patrick has, thank you very much, Patrick, has also uh, added a super chat here. So I appreciate that. We're already uh, a minute into the show. And uh, that's uh, excellent support. Uh, Patrick has a question that they've put in the form. We will be getting to those in a moment. Now, I normally have a feature topic at the front of the show here, and I kind of was, was thinking about this. I'm like, I don't actually really have a feature topic, except to say that we would talk about the Q&A show and the Q&A format. So I guess instead of a feature topic this week, what I would like to do is invite you to provide me with feedback and to let me know what you want this show to be. So we are at episode 65 of Home Studio Q&A. We've been doing it for over a year now, and uh, it has grown and developed and morphed and changed. But we've, we've introduced the form where you can actually add your questions now as opposed to putting in the chat there. And the timing of this, we usually run for about 45 minutes. So what I kind of want to know is, uh, is this the right format? Do you like the Q&A format? Do you like the opportunity to ask questions? And do you have any recommendations, ideas, suggestions? Because it is you uh, that is in control here. Uh, and if you've got uh, ideas about how we can change and improve the show, then go ahead and do that. We did try something new today uh, for those that were well live beforehand. We did a pre-show over on Clubhouse. So let me know also if you have been checking out the Clubhouse app. It is a, I, I worry that this is going to date date this episode because you'll probably go back in a year's time and go, oh yeah, remember when everyone was really hyped about Clubhouse? But for right now, it is kind of the big, new, flashy, up and coming, hyped up social network. It is audio only and it is iOS only so far. So if you do want to join the clubhouse and uh, join the club and get in on the the action uh, then yeah do do uh, consider that because we did uh, something today which was a lot of fun where we had folks that could actually come in live before the show and actually uh, ask some questions and and give some feedback and have a chat beforehand so we did a little warm-up pre-show and then we jumped into the video show here so that was a lot of fun and uh, I will continue to do more things like that myself and uh, and uh, my fellow creator and friend Jade Starr uh, we are going to put it to the test because why not why not actually try these things when they put them out there? Uh, why not actually give them a go and see how it goes? So if you do want to uh, join us, then uh, do consider that. Alrighty, let's jump straight into some questions then, shall we? Because uh, I'll check the form here and we'll start answering. I, I usually get to this point and I've only got three questions and I'm like, oh, cool, I'll, I'll answer these and, and go into some detail. And by the time I get to the end of the third question, we have like five more questions. So why don't we jump in and get started so that we can get to these questions? I apologize. That was really... Uh that was really bad. When you get a frog in your throat, just as you're talking, I'm like, I could hear it coming. I could feel it coming. Let's jump in and ask us some questions. Ganesh asked the first question here, which says, which of the two in, two out USB audio interfaces can be used standalone with headphones or studio monitors without connecting to an iPad or an iPhone or a computer? What an interesting question. So we're looking to use a two in, two out audio interface, but not actually connect it to an iPhone, an iPad, or a computer. Uh, this is this is an interesting one. I have tried this before, and I've never really found a device that works well. So what I'll do is we'll jump over here to my gear guide, which is at studiolivetoday.com slash gear, so you can check out the recommendations that I have. Uh, so if we go down here and we look at audio interfaces, so the ones that I generally recommend and use, the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, the Steinberg UR22C uh, or 22 Mark II. Now, I'm pretty sure that both of these, whilst they can be powered, you probably, I haven't tried it, 
Short answer is I'll need to try it, but something like the Steinberg might be your best bet because it actually has a separate power supply. So if you look at the Steinberg UR22C that I'm showing on the screen here for those watching the video version, it has uh, the two inputs uh, and on the back, it actually has a separate power. So the power source is either directly via USB 3, so you plug into your iPhone, iPad, PC, Mac, or via a 5 volt DC separate charger. So that may be an option, and I'll, I'll have to do some experimenting, to be honest. But if anyone here, this is the beauty of having the live chat. If anyone here in the live chat either can test it while we're doing it, because uh, I guess what you're looking to do is use this more as a mixer. And that's probably the next point I'll make is that I would probably look to a mixer if you're utilizing something like this, if you want to do it for, for live or for something where you're just sending the audio out from the monitors here to some speakers or a PA, I think a mixer would be better for, for a couple of reasons. The problem with an audio interface is that you're going to have one channel on the left and one on the right. So even if you say you hook this up to a PA and you could get it working without a Mac or a PC and therefore you're monitoring the audio directly through the interface, you're going to find that your left has all of your vocals. Let's say you plug vocals and guitar in, your left speaker is going to have all your vocals and your right speaker is going to have your guitar. Now there's software that can help it change that and you can run it through a DAW to, to change it but then you're using a computer or you're using a, uh, a, a device for that. What I would probably do more so uh, is look for a mixer. So, uh, and now, I've, I, do I have it on here still? I, I, I don't think I have it as, even though it's currently my current mixer, but we'll jump over to Sweetwater and we'll find it. So the Samson MixPad is what I'm using right now. And these are actually really good, uh, really uh, good value for money in terms of what you can get. So this is the exact board that I'm talking through right now. It's the MixPad MXP124FX with USB and effects. So it's a $180 mixer. But you can see the benefit of this is you get four inputs and you get up to, I think it's 12 total. Yeah, so you get 12 channels in. So you get four microphone preamps with compressors on two of the channels there, with gain controls, with all your EQ, you can add effects and you can adjust your panning. So if you're going to play through something and you wanted to send it straight out without using anything, a mixer is probably where you want to go to. So that's what I recommend. The other ones that are good are the Yamaha MG series that I know a lot of folks use. So if we come over here to Yamaha MG, there's the 10XU, the 12XU, the 16XU. One of the Yamaha MG series, why are you not going there? One of the Yamaha MG series will probably do the job uh, just as well, if not a little better, because the preamps on these are, uh, are quite good. Uh, they use the same Yamaha d that are used on the Steinberg audio interfaces. So you're not actually getting any trade-off in quality. You're uh, getting everything you need. Uh, so yeah, that, that hopefully that uh, that helps answer your question. So, uh, and uh, got a question here. What are you even talking about? Yeah, I think we got off track there. So if you want to utilize a mic and a, and a guitar or you know, a couple of microphones and you want to uh, not have them recorded, not use them through a computer or an iPhone or iPad, hopefully that gives you some ideas. But as always, if anyone has any better suggestions, please let us know here in the chat. Uh, I realized that the reason that uh, I think a viewer here said, I don't know what you're talking about, is that I didn't put the uh, I didn't put it in the, the comments here, which is what I normally do. So let's do that this time around. I'll actually create that. So uh, we'll come here and we'll answer the next question by me pasting it in here and popping it up on the screen. Uh, so next question here, how to get the MIDI data of the accompaniment, accompaniment rhythm that you chose to play along with the notes you play on a keyboard like the Korg PS600 over USB into GarageBand on iPad? So this is an interesting question. If you're looking to get something from your keyboard into GarageBand, and we'll, I was just talking about this with Jade actually, and in How To App today, Jade's talking about her new uh, keyboard, the Arturia Keystep 37, and uh, is talking about all the different functions and how it integrates and works with GarageBand. So that's gonna be a great show for you to watch to find out a little bit more about this, but here's how it breaks down with MIDI, excuse me. <clears throat> Scary, uh, that's better. Here's how it breaks down with MIDI. So if we come back over to my suggested stuff here, the MIDI keyboard that I use and that I recommend which is this one here, is the M Audio Key Station Mark III. And uh, being a bit slow here on sweet, sweet Water today. So which is this one, which is a, a 49 key keyboard. It's $99. It just works. It just does the things. But it doesn't have what you're talking about here with your Korg. It doesn't have the accompaniments. It's really just for, it, it's a dumb machine. <laughs> it's for sending out MIDI and sending that MIDI data into something that's going to take that data 
and then trigger a virtual instrument. Now, what it seems that you're asking for here is to be able to actually take, say, the actual sounds from your MIDI keyboard or the drum sounds or the accompaniment sounds from your keyboard. That's a different thing because that is usually audio. Now, there's some ways to do this where you can trigger your keyboard from a MIDI device. GarageBand doesn't allow it, but some other apps can let you actually control your keyboard using the software. So you can actually program in and then that will actually play your keyboard. What it sounds like you want though is to actually record in. So what you'd need to do is if you've got your keyboard, I've actually got a video on it. Let's see if I can find the video real quick where I did it. Uh, where you can record it in and uh, you can record it either in mono or stereo so if I search my name and stereo record Pete John stereo record is what I'm searching and there's a video there so there I show you how I use my keyboard because I, I was the same I wanted the actual sounds that are inside my Casio digital piano as opposed to using it just to trigger sounds in GarageBand so if you're ever wanting to do that what you'll need to do is get yourself an audio interface or mixer just like we spoke about in the last question and then actually plug out of the line output from your keyboard or the headphone jack even and then plug that into your actual audio interface and you can either do that as I say in, in a mono just using a standard instrument cable or you can do that in stereo using a TRS a stereo TRS or stereo RCA output depending what your keyboard has so hopefully that helps you out but yeah in terms of if you've got like complicated rhythms that your Korg is playing and trying to send those as drum triggers over to GarageBand I think you'll probably struggle it might work with some other uh, DAWs on your iPhone or iPad but in my experience it's a little bit clunky and it's kind of hard to get it to line up and the MIDI clocks to sink in. That all being said, I'm more than happy to be corrected because there's definitely folks who know a lot more about MIDI and about using MIDI in their songs than what I do. So uh, thank you for the question, my friend, and we will move on to our next one. Uh, let's see, I will answer this question. Actually, I won't put it in there because the question from Grant is, uh, what email do I, oh, so what email do I use to send on a SoundCloud link to your review on your YouTube channel? Ah, okay. <laughs> so this is a question about, I will add it in here just so that you know what I'm talking about. If you, if you drop into the channel and you're watching halfway through, the question is, what email do I use to send a SoundCloud link to review on your YouTube channel? So for those who aren't aware, if you're, you're here for the first time or you don't watch some of the other shows, we do a show every week, every, every Saturday morning here, but it's every Friday afternoon at this exact same time. So Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And uh, that is called Your Music Live. And if you do have a song that you want to submit, all you need to do is actually jump over. In fact, I can show you. We're, we're a visual medium here. And I know for those listening on the podcast, I apologize <laughs> that you're not going to be able to see this. But if we jump on over to this, you can see that we go to studiolivetoday.com slash YML. If you put that in, you'll jump straight into this form. And all you need to do is drop in your name, your email address, your link to your song, your SoundCloud or YouTube or Slaps or wherever you've got it, and then one or two sentences about your song. And that's the important thing because if you've watched the show, what we do is we play songs by independent artists. It's a, it's a good time. It's a two-hour show. It's basically like a party. It's my, one of my favorite times of the week. But we, we grab the song that has been played, we put it up on the screen, so a YouTube video or a SoundCloud link, and uh, and then we play one or two minutes of it. And then uh, the, the folks in the chat get to have a listen. And uh, yeah, if there's any feedback or comments they have, they'll drop that in. And then uh, we put all of those together in the description, all of those links uh, of about the 50 or 60 songs we played. And then folks can go back and check those out after the show. So if anyone has any songs that they want to get uh, played on the show, uh, please do submit them using that form. Studiolivetoday.com slash YML. That stands for Your Music Live. And do join us because we have a heck of a lot of fun on Your Music Live. Just going to have a wee drink. Little coffee time. Uh, uh, so thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for answering. Thanks for asking it. And as Russ says uh, here, yeah, YML is a fantastic time and Alex is a fan. Al Alex had a, a very cool um, very cool uh, song that we played this week on Your Music Live, who's here in the chat. Let's continue on. Um, Tom, Tom has a comment on, uh, on the previous question. Uh, it says, uh, be a good idea to look in the manual of the keyboard. They usually have full MIDI implementation that will help determine how that accompany and rhythm data is transmitted. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I can't really give a specific answer because if your keyboard's a, a Casio or a Yamaha or a Korg, they all do things slightly differently. But yeah, if you, if you don't have the manual, go online. Most of them are pretty good. You can dig up the manual and find 
find out how it actually sends it. Because if it sends it, as because you can play drums, so if you want the accompaniment and the rhythm, you can, of course, play drums in manually on your MIDI keyboard. You can just hit the drums and they'll trigger your kick drum, your snare, your hi-hat, etc. So you can hit record and do that. If you can hit record and press something on your keyboard that will then play and send an accompaniment rhythm as MIDI over to GarageBand, then yes, that would work. So yeah, good point from Tom there. Uh, give it a go and, uh, and see how it turns out for you. Uh, let's go to our next question. Once again, if you do have questions, uh, just need to go to studiolivetoday.com slash QA and uh, we will answer any of the questions that you have there. Even if it's, will the New York Rangers make the playoffs or who will win the Super Bowl? Uh, I know is the first answer and whatever team Tom Brady is not playing for is the second answer. There you go. I've just offended probably half of the people here, but that's okay. I know nothing about football, uh, not the American style anyway. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, take take anything I say with a grain of salt. Although I am, I'm considering actually watching the uh, Super Bowl for the very first time. Uh, and when I say the very first time, I've obviously watched bits and pieces before, but I've always had a day job. This is the first year where I don't actually have a Monday, because it's Monday morning here in Australia. Uh, so it's the first time that I don't actually have a day job to do, which is uh, which is very cool. Uh, I might actually watch the game. All righty. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, grab a question here from Kev Hart. It's, it's, it's got too many characters for me to put it in the banner here, so we'll just talk it through. Uh, so Kev says, with my ongoing addiction to creating huge drumsticks, drumsticks? That's a different thing. Drumscapes. Jade and I were talking and she mentioned uh, about merging the individual tracks. I know this will save any FX on there, but wondered, will it also save the EQ? Maybe a daft question, but thought I would check before I started making a mess of things. Yes, yes, and yes. So uh, this is probably one that's easier for me to actually demonstrate. So let me grab, let me grab my iPad. And see, I did set up before the show, but now, yeah, we're not we're not really well set up. So I'm just going to plug in and grab grab the iPad, and we'll have a little bit of a play with this, shall we? We'll just wait for the audio to kick in here, and uh, there it is. So now we'll jump over, we'll jump over and bring up my iPad on the screen here. So the short answer is yes, Kev. Uh, if you don't want, the, if you just want to go and get back to work, uh, the short answer is yes. So if you're not familiar with what we're talking about here. Uh, when you are actually merging down tracks, what it does is it takes the audio of one, two or more tracks and merges them together. At the same time, it will actually merge the effects that are on those tracks. So if, for instance, I had these two vocal takes here, so we've got one vocal take on, on one track, we'll just... Uh, We'll solo these. So we've got one vocal take there, one vocal take there. We could merge these two together onto one track. So I'm assuming with your drums, you might have a couple of different drum sounds on two different tracks and you want to merge them. Everything that you actually add here in the plugins and EQ section gets merged as well. So if you, if you think about, it's like freezing a track or like um, exporting a track, rendering a track. Um, there's other words for it, but merging is what GarageBand calls it. So for instance, if I wanted to, uh, now these vocals are pretty bad, so um, please please bear with me, but if I want to merge the original track here with the vocals, the these uh, rough vocals that I've been doing here, uh, we'll just play this and make sure we've got the audio coming through. We'll rise together. We will rise together. So yeah, if we're, if we're merging these tracks, you'll hear that on this one, it's already got, uh, it's got a little bit of overdrive and echo and compression and reverb on there. If we did EQ this, so let's say we wanted to really take off the low end of the, the vocals there, uh, once we actually merge this, it will merge in those settings. So it's important to keep in mind because when you merge it, it will put all of these settings on that. The other way to do it, uh, so let's just show what we do. So if we say grab this track and we tap it and we go merge, uh, we've already got all those effects on there. We're going to merge it. Uh, yet we'll just merge that one track, but it would be the same if we merged multiple tracks. Or just to show you how it works, let's merge multiple tracks. We merge them together. It's going to render out both of these tracks onto one separate stereo track. And that separate stereo track won't have any effects, any EQ, anything on there. So here it is. This is what it's put together. And if we come here, this will actually have... We will rise together... So you can hear it's still got that delay and that reverb and that EQ cut that we did there. But when we come in here, that's all been baked in. So now it doesn't have it here. So if we went in and we re-added a bunch more of this, you'd kind of be double processing with your EQ, with your reverb, with your delay. So the other way that folks often do with this, if we just exit out of there, 
uh, it, it always creates a copy of this stuff when you do merging, which is a handy thing because it means you don't break anything if you do the wrong thing. So the other way to do it would be before you merge, come in here, turn everything off. So turn off all of your different effects by tapping the blue button, turn off your EQ, merge it as a dry audio file, and then make a duplicate copy. So what, what I would do is I'd make a duplicate copy of this with just the settings. So all the settings I want, I'd come back to here, I'd turn all of these off, and then I'd merge the dry sound, put that onto this track, and then I can add back in all of the same stuff that I had. That just means that if you want to tweak it afterwards, you're not baking in all of those settings. Does that make sense? So yeah, if you're merging, two ways to go. If you're committing to it, leave all your stuff on there, merge it, mix it down, render it, but then you can't change it because then it's all baked in. If you don't want it baked in, you want the ability to change it afterwards, take all that off, merge, export, render out the dry signal, put it back on the track, add your plugins back on. Hopefully that helps you and anyone else who's uh, playing with that. Because yeah, even with 32 tracks, and I, I was watching Jade, because Jade's producing uh, one of Kev's songs at the moment, and even with 32 tracks, uh, you can quickly run out of tracks to actually do that. Uh, uh, quest question uh, that Lady Rodeline has related to that. Do I ever lower the top end? Yeah, I do, but more so on something like a bass guitar or a kick drum or something like that, that maybe it's got some high frequencies or some resonance coming through that I don't want on there. So if you've got like a really, let's, uh, I'll show you. We'll, we'll do a quick demo just because EQ is uh, something that, that is, is kind of tricky to, to work out sometimes. So if I grab a drum track, in fact, what we'll do, we'll use the we'll use the beat sequencer. Let me bring this up over here. So let's say we wanted a beat sequencer track. We wanted a really simple one that is literally just a four on the floor kick drum beat. We don't want an 808. We want something like like the minimalist. So yeah, there's our minimalist track. So let's just um, come out here to the track view. We'll just solo just this track. So we're just hearing the kick drum. And we'll go back to beat sequencer. We'll hit the record button. Or actually, we'll turn it on. And we'll hit the record button. And this will just so there's a there's our kick drum recorded we'll come back out to here there we go <laughs> that would probably suit this song this song anyway um oh i've got my i've got the time ruler on here i was wondering i'm like why can't i see that all right go back to go back to bars uh we'll loop this out just so that we can keep hearing it so we've got this kick drum beat that's just doing this so what you'd probably want to, to do with eq on something like this is come into your visual eq and if we turn up the treble to start with, here, how are you getting more of that clicky kind of sound? So let's say you wanted a real sub bass kind of sound on that kick. What you'd do is you'd roll off the top. And then hear how it's just sitting underneath. And the further you go down, it comes up that heartbeat kind of thing. So yeah, if you're finding you're getting too much click in your kick and your bass drum, then uh, yeah, you can absolutely do the same thing because obviously you may not want it to sound like that. And if you if your kick drum sounding like that, come and roll that off. Uh, yeah, and the opposite, as, as we said before, like a kick drum, you wouldn't want to remove all this stuff because if you remove everything below the 200, take a listen to that. <laughs> then you get just that click. But that's something that can actually work for some types of music. So a lot of uh, what sort of thing that Kev's producing and a lot of what Jay does and Gary Hubs and other folks on this channel, they may actually do that. They may actually have a separate track, which is more of that click, because you kind of, you want the boominess of the drum, but sometimes you also want that click of the beater hitting the drums. So uh, yeah, there, there's a couple of options for you there. But yeah, just think about the instrument and then think about what the instrument would need is the best way to approach it. So for your vocals, you may want a little bit of airiness in the top end. So you may want to boost up the treble. You probably don't want any rumbling down unless you're, unless you're singing some uh, Barry White. Then uh, you may want a little more bass in your, in your voice. Guitars are obviously more mid-rangey, but again, you don't really want too much high end or low end. So just listen to it. And that's why pe people say, oh, Pete, whenever you use the EQ, you never turn on the visualizer. So you may be aware that your EQ here actually has a visual, oh, sorry, an analyzer. So we can actually play this with the analyzer and you can actually see, you can see the main frequencies and as you enhance them, you can see where they are. But it's not really telling you much because it's telling you based on where you're putting your EQ. See how it drops it down there? And as we bring it up, it brings it up. So that, that to me, 
it, it, it's mixing with your eyes and not with your ears. So I, I would prefer I prefer to leave it off just because I don't want I don't want the EQ decisions I make to be based on what I'm looking at. I want them to be based on what I'm hearing because my end you, viewer end user is not going to be looking at my song. They're going to be listening to it, or at least I hope they are. <laughs> uh, let's jump into our next question that we have here because we've got a few more to go. And this is from Patrick, uh, who says, uh, thanks for all you've offered. Uh, could you share which, uh, in fact, we'll pop it up on the screen uh, so that other folks can see this. We'll put it here. We'll create a banner. Boom. So this is what Patrick has to ask. Could you share which plugin and how you would set a subtle reverb and delay when recording live or performing live with a PA? Yeah, really good question. And I haven't really used a lot of, I, I need to do this more and more. I haven't really done it through GarageBand because to be honest, and I've got my mixer sitting right here. I also have the Zoom live track mixer that I have over to the other side. There's, um, I, I don't tend to use, oh, sorry, I've got things clipping here. I don't tend to use um, the software to actually play through. I'll tend to use the reverb and delay and just set it on my mixer. So for instance, the, the board that I'm using over here has built-in effects and I'm using one of the small room reverb sounds so that when I play, so later today when I do my happy hour show, I'm using exactly the same setup, but I just turn the one dial and suddenly I have this. So if I'm singing, oh, you have that sound. So I can actually dial in a, a variation of delay or reverb or whatever I want just to be subtle. And because it's on a one dial, we can make it like this when we need to go doctor's orders, or we could actually bring it down a little bit when we want just a little bit of room sound to add the reverb. So that's probably the simplest way is to get a mixer. So the Yamaha MG, all the stuff I was talking about before, the Samson, the Yamaha MG series, they all do a good job. If you do want to use software, so let's say you're plugging in through GarageBand and you want to do it, uh, here's what I would use. And it does depend on the instrument that you're using, but let's jump over to the iPad again. Uh, we'll actually create a fresh track for this because I don't think a dance track's going to work for us. So we'll hit create song here. So if I was setting this up, I'd set up my audio recorder. Uh, the first thing I'd do is come in here to more sounds and I use the vocal presets. Now, it really depends on the sort of sound that you're looking to get, but the, uh, the lead vocals tends to have the right sort of plugins that I tend to like here. So if we tap on that one, now I don't have a mic plugged in because I, I probably should do that, but I don't have a mic plugged in to actually, so you can hear this, but what you have, if we go to plugins and EQ here, you've got your compressor on here. So that's just gonna dial dial that up to get the right sound. And in fact, there's I've got a full video. So if you search Pete John's record vocals or Pete John's vocal settings, I go through all of these in more detail and actually demonstrate them. But just to give you the quick rundown, you can set your compressor there. I use a little bit of overdrive. So that just gives you, uh, so I'll usually add say one or two dB here. That just sort of dirties it up a bit because I tend to find that digital recording and digital vocals, it sounds a little bit too clean at times and rubbing it in the dirt a bit with some overdrive works well. And of course the other one we have here is track reverb. But by default, the track reverb they set here is 21% wet. <laughs> so I'll normally grab that and turn that down to maybe about 10%. Depends, just listen back to your monitor and see what sounds good. The other thing that I'll do with this is I tend to turn off this effect EQ because this doesn't really do anything. This is just this tone knob over here. So we get rid of that. And what I add in is some track delay or track echo. So we'll come over here, go to track echo, and this gives you that slap back or that quarter note kind of delay. So I'll normally use like an eighth note or a quarter note delay. And I just find that when I'm singing or recording vocals or listening back, that can sound good. Not too much of it, but if we went in here and say did an eighth note, then again, dial your wet signal down to maybe 10%, maybe even 5%, and just give you that little bit. So what this will give you is, you got your compressor for volume to make sure you've got a uniform volume. You've got some echo, and you can change the order of these two. So if you hit the edit button, you can shimmy these around if you want the reverb to come and then the echo, or the echo, then the reverb. Normally you'll want your compression up the front, your effects, and then your EQ at the end. And in terms of EQ, when I'm tracking, I don't usually add much. I usually EQ afterwards. But what you can do is, depending on your vocal style, you might want to add a little air. So you might want to just add a little bit at the top end. Or what a lot of folks do is they'll roll off anything below, say, 100 hertz. So they'll do a low, low cut or high pass filter. And that will just reduce any of those rumbling noises or non-vocal noises that you may be introducing in there. Uh, if you're then playing a guitar, I'm not sure if you asked about guitar, but if you were doing, say, an acoustic guitar, what you would do is add a second track here. So we'll go plus, 
Again, we'll go the more sounds, but this time we'll go acoustic guitar and I use the nice room. And to be honest, I, I usually leave it at pretty much the default settings because the nice room again has your compressor. You may just need to drive the, the threshold down a little bit if you're not getting an even sound. It's got the track reverb again, which uh, is, I, I leave it a bit wetter on the guitar to be honest, but probably only around 20%. And then uh, any EQ that you want to do again, you can either leave that flat or enhance. And, and sometimes, depending on your guitar, uh, if it's coming through the the, uh, the pickup on the guitars, like the built-in pickup, uh, the electric pickup, then you may just want to find a frequency because they've usually got this twangy frequency around about sort of 1,000 or 2,000 hertz. So sometimes I'll come in here and just cut a little bit of that just to make sure that the guitar is sitting in nicely with the vocal. And then, yeah, then you're good to go. So if you've got a two-channel interface or a mixer, then you've got your vocals on one channel, your guitar on another channel, and uh, you should be good to go. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. And yes, yeah, subtlety is, I'm glad you said subtle because subtlety is the key. And the way that I get subtlety is turn it up and then dial it back until it sounds the right level. It can be hard. If you start at zero, you tend to not really be able to hear the effect well enough. So you're not really, you can't really tell what you're listening for. But if you grab an effect, and I mean, you, you can do it either way, but it's, it's something, if you've never tried this, just try it. Just turn it up all the way and just wash it with that effect and then just dial it down. And then you'll hit the point where you're like, you can still hear it, but it's not overpowering. And to me, that's, that's the key to getting a subtle sound. Uh, hello to, to uh, folks who have joined us here live. Gazo, I see you've snuck in there. Lady Rotaline, Ed Zed, uh, Michael, aka Zealand Band, uh, and anyone else, if you do have questions, we've still got about 20 minutes left. So uh, please throw your questions in the form. But we better move on because we do have some more to get to here today. A little cold coffee, and then we'll move on. Uh, let's go to our next question, shall we? And this one... Uh, is uh, from our friend John Elam. Hello, John. It says, uh, how do I send tracks or projects to my songwriter friends who have Logic or Cubase? Right. Now, uh, because we're, because we're going to get short on time, uh, rather than actually show you this, the, the answer is stems, but I'll explain what I mean through the way of uh, some other videos that we have here. I just need to find find my... <laughs> I'm, I'm still still getting my hang get, still getting my head around the Mac here. I need to be able to find my uh, my browser tab. So I've actually done a video on how to export stems. So assuming that you're using GarageBand, but really the principle is the same with anything. Obviously, the quickest and easiest way to go is to export your project and then have someone else import that project so that you can actually keep all the settings, all the tracks are in there. So if you're collaborating with someone on Logic and you have GarageBand, for instance, well, Logic will open GarageBand projects. It will open GarageBand iOS projects. It'll open GarageBand Mac projects. But as soon as that person has used it and then saves the project in Logic, there ain't no going back. So that's where stems come in. So if uh, I'll just search my name, Pete Johns and stems, I've got a couple of videos on stem exporting here on the channel. As you can see over here, I would go this second one. For some reason, <laughs> I do an updated video. For some reason, YouTube continues to insist upon putting my oldest, most outdated video at the top. So that one's from two years ago. This second one here, for those watching live, is from just six months ago. So it's called How to Export Individual Tracks in GarageBand iOS. The unfortunate thing is GarageBand iOS doesn't have an easy way to do it apart from soloing and exporting individual tracks as individual WAV files, saving them out and then sending them off. So if you are getting someone who's using Cubase and you're using GarageBand or whatever and you want to actually export those tracks. Now some DAWs like Reaper on the PC do really awesome things. They have an export all tracks as stems option and that can save you a heck of a lot of time. I, I hope and pray that one day uh, GarageBand will have that option. But for now, unfortunately, you're going to have to do that. Now, if you've got a four-track or an eight-track project, that ain't too bad. If you've got a 32-track project, yeah, it can be a bit of a pain in the in the back side. But uh, that's what you'll need to do. Export those uh, as stem files, as high-resolution WAV files, and then they can be imported at the other end, and you should be good to go. Uh, let's get to our next one. Patrick Chandler. 
uh, says all, uh, it's got a longer one, so we won't be able to put it on the screen. It says, all of my audio unit extensions are showing up with the default GB orange icon when choosing the effects and audio extensions. All the plugins are there and functioning, but they're just orange icon. I turned off a restart of my iPad, but I've not reset GB as I'm currently working on projects. So yeah, um, this is a common problem, unfortunately, and uh, a lot of folks are actually suffering from it. So uh, let's just come back over here. We'll pop that one down. We'll, we'll hide you. I'll hide you behind that way. I'll know I can come back to you afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people are having this problem, which is when you come into plugins and EQ and you go to edit and you go to add a plugin here under audio unit extensions, these are all orange. These all look just like these Apple ones. They'll look like that. Now, this there's been a bunch of fixes that have come in in recent updates. So if you, first thing I would say is make sure you're running GarageBand 2.3.10 and iOS 14.4. Uh, I understand if you're working on projects that can feel a bit risky, uh, but if you're using iCloud Drive, make sure your projects are backed up or are saved in iCloud Drive. If you're worried about them, save a copy. So I've got videos here on the channel where I show you how to export and save as a zip file. So you get your project, you zip it up, stick it on Google Drive or Dropbox as an absolute sort of Hail Mary last resort. But yeah, I, I did a, a video about this, which yeah, you can you can turn off and on. You can close all your apps, turn them off and on. You can come back in and do your reset GarageBand thing, which is uh, not actually in here, it's actually in your settings. So if you come to your regular settings option over here and go down to GarageBand, well, you can see my daily screen time. It's actually not too shameful because I'm usually on my iPhone. Uh, so if you come to GarageBand, you can actually do the reset GarageBand. Here's the thing, it won't do anything to your projects. The only thing it resets are things like these. So it'll reset your keyboard note labels. It'll change you back to 16-bit audio from 24-bit audio. So there's only about three or four changes you need to make once you do the reset. And that can work for you. I've still got people that have said, Pete, I've tried absolutely everything and it's not working. And it seems to be on like the iPad. I'm not sure what iPad you're using, but the iPad Air third generation and like the iPad 2018 around about that era, which is weird because the older iPads and iPhones, it's not happening for. The newer ones, it's not happening for. For some reason, if you've got something that's a couple of years old, that seems to be the ones that it's happening for. I know it's a pain in the butt. And as you say, if you're working on a project, I would finish up that project before you make any significant changes if you're worried about it because obviously they're all working but it's just a pain when you want that nice little icon you want the little you want the little icon there that looks cool you don't want just an, an orange blob so um yeah, and if anyone else uh, here in the chat has any other suggestions or has had the same problem and it's uh, worked it out then uh, do let us know here in the comments uh, but thank you for your question let's move on because we've got a few more questions here in the form uh, from hw uh, has a question here, which is the following. I'm going to get quicker with these, but I like to have them on the screen if I can. Uh, so a uh, question is, uh, what are your tips to record your voice without a microphone? I love your videos, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, so I did a whole video on this and I'm looking to do another video on it soon because the video I did is quite old. It's uh, it, it was recorded back in, I reckon, 2017. Let's, let's find it. So uh, if we search Pete John's No Gear you will get, yeah, three years ago. So it was 2017, 2018, around that mark. So this video, if you search Pete John's No Gear, uh, I do actually a complete demo recording my guitar and recording my vocals just using the iPad. <laughs> so and it's kind of hard to demonstrate here and I show it in the video, but the key things when you're recording with just the iPhone mic or the iPad mic is get a pair of headphones that don't have a microphone. So the built-in mics in your iPad and your iPhone are actually surprisingly good and they're 100% fine for a demo and many people have even recorded entire songs. When Dan Baker recorded violins for one of my songs, he just used a built-in microphone on his iPhone SE and they sound amazing. So you don't need a lot of expensive gear. The key to this is making sure that you are not you're not singing directly into the microphone because these things are pretty sensitive. They're obviously very small microphones in there. They're quite sensitive. So get some distance from you. Record in a small place. So try to get to the smallest room in your house, not the toilet, because that's usually got reflective walls. But uh, a closet is good, like a built-in cupboard. Don't, don't go in like a tiny closet or a smaller room. Put blankets around. Many people have recorded literally with a blanket over their head. Because the hardest thing with this is you're getting a lot of reflections. You're getting a lot of reverberance from the space and you'll hear a lot of the room sound when you're recording. So keep that in mind. And then uh, in terms of pop filtering, get, get a pop filter or something. If you are singing closer, put something between you. And that can be an actual pop filter or if you've got no gear at all, wire coat hanger, 
and a stocking or something that can actually just do that. Or you can even use like something like this, a piece of foam and just put it over the top of there. So just get a little bit of foam from something, I don't know, or even like a piece of towel, like really thin cloth, like one of those wipes that you use in the kitchen and put that over there because you want to protect that microphone from your t -t -p -p -p, any of those harsh sounds. So there's a few tips. You can definitely do it. Trial and error is your friend with this stuff and just see what works. Try recording like that, then like that, then like that, and then just uh, do trial and error until you work out what works best for your vocals. But hopefully uh, that helps you out. But yeah, the key is if you've got headphones, something like this that has the built-in mic, well, it's going to use this microphone, which is not bad. Actually, on these, the JBL Endurance Run, these headphones actually have a decent quality mic. But if you're using some others and you want to make sure you're using the built-in mic, then get some headphones that don't have a microphone. And they're not expensive. You can get little in-air ones for about five bucks on eBay. But because everyone wants a microphone these days, they're actually getting harder to find in the wild. So hopefully that helps you out. Let's move on to some other questions. Uh, there's a question from No Offense, which is the greatest name for a YouTube <laughs> YouTube name. And No Offense, this question is, do you have any tips on making an instrumental song? Yeah, uh, I haven't made instrumental songs for a long time, but I'm actually about to uh, re-explore to get back into more instrumental music. But in the past, I have indeed made quite a few instrumental songs. Uh, loops can be your friend with instrumental songs. So if we come over here again to my videos, if you search my name and loops, learning how to use, because there's in GarageBand, there's five different types of loops and pretty much every DAW has some sort of loops in there. Don't be afraid to use those loops. Sometimes, even if it's just to give you inspiration, I've actually done songs before where I've used a drum loop, I've built a song around it, and then I've got rid of the drum loop. So the drum loop has just given me the groove and the feel, and then I build a song around that. Or you may want to keep them in there. So that's that's something to do. Uh, I think I did one where I showed how I just made a beat, like a five-minute beat. Uh, yeah, this one here, how to create a GarageBand beat in five minutes. So if you search out that one, just so Pete John's beat, and then, uh, yeah, GarageBand beat in five minutes. And, and that was a fun time. That just showed that sometimes just giving yourself a time window and just creating that, creating an eight bar loop. The other thing I would say is uh, Joey Helpish, even though not Joey's stuff isn't um, just instrumental, he does a lot of really, he, he shows you the process of how to bring all this stuff together, how to grab a loop, how to grab a virtual instrument that you're playing in and how to do it in blocks. He's, he's much better at doing that, um, that sequencing and arranging and doing things in chunks and blocks, which is what can work really well for your instrumental songs. So definitely go and check out Joey. Joey's channel, Joey Helpish. He's the only Joey Helpish in town and uh, that should give you some good ideas. But uh, good questions and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll re-explore that in some future videos here on the channel because I've, I've got this uh, idea that I want to create a second artist name called Righty Doki and I'm going to produce some uh, some lo-fi or some chill beats and laid back tunes and instrumentals because it's, it's a lot of fun. And when you don't have to worry about the words you're writing or singing or even recording live instruments and you can do it all right there on your iPhone or iPad or Mac or PC, it can be a heck of a lot of fun. Let's uh, continue on to our next question. This comes from Krita Jason uh, said, what what instruments are acceptable above zero dB in the mix? So this is an interesting question that I could probably spend a couple of hours on, but I'll give the quick answer here. So it really depends. A lot of folks say you know, nothing can ever clip. If you ever see any orange or red on your tracks, then something's wrong and you need to fix it. That's true, except for the fact that when you've got, so let's bring my iPad back up here. When you've got a track here that's a virtual instrument track, it actually doesn't really matter. And I say that, but then I say still take care with it. Because if we grab this track and we say we put a, in fact, we'll do, use a loop because um, we were talking loops before. Whoops, I've gone out of there. Go back in, oh, where are we? My song. Uh, it disappeared because I hadn't recorded anything into it. <laughs> so we're coming into the audio recorder. We'll go up to here. And say so I was bringing in a, a loop like, uh, what's something cool? I do like the, uh, the 80s. There you go. Bring that one in. So if we're playing this. You'll see here, that's looking good, yeah? If we turn it all the way up here, it's a bad example because it's not actually going to hit on there. Let's try and find a more full-on loop that's actually going to give us a big sort of sound. This one with a bit of a kick drum might be good. So if we bring this one in here. Yeah, there we go. That's actually a cool beat. 
there you go, I might make something with that later. So you can see there that both of these now are hitting that red. So you're getting those red dots there. Now, the thing with GarageBand is it will protect you from yourself. It will realize that these are virtual instruments. They're not going to actually clip. They're not an analog sound clipping an analog signal. So it will limit those. It'll push them down from the top and it'll keep everything at zero dB. So to kind of answer your question, most, well, GarageBand and using digital audio, it won't let you go over zero dB. But what it will do is if you have too many tracks together, all going over zero dB, it'll start pumping. So you'll get that overall limiting and you hear that at the top end. So you'll hear your volume going up and down and that can actually be more annoying and more of a problem than your individual instruments. So my advice is always to just bring everything down and it's all relative because at the end of the day, when you export it, it's all gonna export out and it's gonna normalize up to zero dB. So it's more about your total volume than it is about your individual instruments. So if we did this, and I really wanted this beat to be right up there. Then that's no problem there, but you can already hear with that kick drum, it's starting to kind of compress, it's starting to get that, you're hearing a little bit of that distortion. So just keeping everything down a little bit and then turning your other instruments down, keeping it all relative, that can actually help you out. So I don't know if that answered exactly your question, but hopefully that gave you some ideas uh, for what to do there. But yeah, luckily, as opposed to when you plug a microphone in, if it's above zero dB and you're distorting, that's terrible. That's digital clipping, that's never going to be able to be repaired. With your virtual instruments, you get a little bit more leeway and it's not quite as uh, as much of a problem. Uh, no offense, another question. Do you have any tips adding bass to a song? Uh, yeah, so I did, a, a, again, I'll, because we're running low on time, I'll have to direct you to some other bass videos. But to, to be really quick, uh, as we just talked about with your bass, make sure it's not overpowering. So make sure you, it's not, because uh, your, your 808 basses, your kick drums, your bass, um, bass sounds can be the ones that really do push your song over the edge. So if you're ever creating a song and you're hearing that you're getting that pumping at the top end, then try to turn down your bass or take your bass you may just be able to tweak some eq to get that the other thing is if you go back to the eq that we talked about earlier in the show uh, the same as the kick drum is for the bass so if you're finding there's too much clicky in the top end of your bass then you might want to uh, reduce the the um the eq down there and you may even want to boost up your eq at the low end to get it to really sparkle and stand out from your other tracks uh, i think there's some videos on the channel about bass uh, if you search the, the the key thing is if you if you're looking for stuff search my name and then the word so if you're on youtube pete john's bass and uh, you'll be able to find all the bass videos that i've done in the past let's just see see if uh, i've got one that i can recommend for you here are pete john's bass uh, I'm sure I've done. Yeah, so I did the recent one, which is uh, all about virtual bass. So that's about uh, all the bass, how to use bass in GarageBand, how to create that. I've got uh, ones on the bass guitar, using a guitar as a bass. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a bunch in there that uh, that I've gone through in the past. And Jade Star on her channel, on her How to App channel, has shown a bunch of different bass amp uh, effects and plugins. So that's another thing I would suggest is to jump over to Jade Star's channel and check out some of her reviews. Um, we're going to run out of time here. I'm sorry, folks. So I'm going to try and get to a couple more questions and then we may have to uh, add these to next week's show. So if you have a question and it's not been answered on today's show, I apologize, but we will be back same time, same bat time, same bat channel next week. And I promise not to confuse you and wear a Christmas shirt for those watching on the video because it is a bit confusing. Uh, question here comes from uh, Barna, who has a question. Should an artist invest on uh, advice, is that, to promote his social profile or Spotify profile for more plays? Yes and no. I'll, I'll answer that in one second after coffee. So here's the deal with, uh, with promoting music. Number one, I am not a music promotion professional. So everything I say must be taken with a grain or perhaps shaker of salt. Number two, yes, if getting advice is a good thing. Here's the thing though. I was talking about this through the week. Get, get, paying for advice is becoming a bit of a diminishing returns thing because so much free information is out there. And yes, some of it is better than other information, but there is so much free information and there's so much kind of peer review on this stuff that if you just go and uh, listen to someone like Damien Keys or anyone else who is a, a professional on Spotify and on music promotion, then they're going to give you all the tools and all the information you need. When someone's hiding, saying, oh, I'll give you this little bit of information, but oh, you gotta buy my $200 course or join my mastermind, and that's where I give you the real information, I would take that with, again, a shaker of salt because there's nothing new. 
and be really careful and really wary of the the, the hacks and the, the shortcuts because yes, there are best practices. There are things you can do. You can submit to playlists. You can promote on social media. You can use things like Instagram and Facebook ads to promote your music. You can get it on TikTok. There's a bunch of different ways, but be super careful for this reason. Just recently, a lot of independent artists got pinged and got their songs removed because of what they call repeat streams or, or illegal streams. That basically means that they had their song there and then they got say 2000 plays but they were made by either bots or by people in like listening farms which is a weird funny term where they were just sitting and replaying songs over and over again just to build up that vanity metric and you know, I, I think there's some accountability for the likes of Spotify for actually driving this because they're the ones that say, hey, if you get all these streams, they send you out reports every week. I get my Spotify thing and every month and it's like, you got this many plays and this many streams. So they are making artists care more about that than the engagement with the actual end listener. So that's, uh, that's a, bit of a bit of a worry. But yeah, the problem there was is that people were paying services. So there's services that can that promise to promote your music on playlists. They promise to get your music in front of executives and a whole bunch of other stuff. The problem was, though, you were paying them $100 and then they were grabbing, not all of them, but the unscrupulous ones were grabbing you $100, paying $20 to a third party who was literally, the way they were getting lots of plays wasn't through promotion and wasn't through getting buzz around your music. It was using these nefarious methods, these bots and these farms. So someone had paid a, paid for someone in good faith, thinking that this was going to promote their music. That person was then subcontracting out the dirty work, and then it was actually the artist in the end who is suffering from this. So be super careful about who you choose and who you get advice from. That's why I love Damien Keys, uh, K-E-Y-E-S on YouTube. He just has really common sense, down-to-earth advice. He will say exactly this stuff. He will say there's no shortcut, there's no hack, there's no growth way to work around around the system, you just have to know the system as best as possible. And then within the confines of that system, work your ass off in social media and in how you actually are promoting things and making really good music. And then you'll be able to actually do that. So hopefully that helps you out and gives you some sort of indication. Um, I really apologize because we do have a bunch more questions here. And uh, yeah, if you join me next week, uh, we will answer those. If, if in the meantime, you do have more pressing concerns or more pressing questions that you need answered really quick, my suggestion would be to head to the Create, Record, Release Facebook group. So uh, it, there's a bunch of really good people over there that can actually help you out. And um, we've got what, 700 members there. And regardless of what platform you're using, whether you're talking about promoting music, recording music, sharing music, or just you want tips on your own music, so you know, how, to, how to add good bass, how to get good vocal recordings, jump over to the Create, Record, Release Facebook group. If you're in GarageBand, there's, of course, the GarageBand Users Facebook group. And as I mentioned up front, the, the new kid on the block is the Clubhouse app. So if you want to, to chat with me and uh, with other folks, we've got Jade Starr, Joey Helpish, a bunch of creators on there, Doug Woods from the Sound Test Room, uh, Patrick uh, from GarageBand Guide has just joined up. So if you want to get a little bit more direct access and ask these sort of questions to some of those folks who have been in there in the trenches recording in the home studio for a long, long time, then that is something that you can do as well. And uh, if you're over on the Facebook group, there's a few of us that still have a few invites to that. So do come over and have a chat. That is going to do it here for today. Uh, as I mentioned up front, I think she's got it there. Yep, there's Jade. Uh, Jade has her how-to app showing off the Arturia Keystep 37 MIDI keyboard. That's happening in like 30 seconds time. So if you want to check out that cool piece of kit, you can do that. If you want to check out my latest video, it's about the things you can't really see behind me, the Presonus Eris monitor speakers. Check that video out. And if you're watching here live, join me for the happy hour. In three hours time, we'll be playing some tunes and it'll be your requests yet again. So that should be a lot of fun. Until next time, folks, as we always say, please be kind to yourselves, be kind to others, keep creating, and rock on. I'll catch you probably on the clubhouse. Take care, folks. Bye for now.